Hello, assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome to another edition of Zoom In on the Halal Metropolis, where we're talking to different members of the Muslim community and seeing how they're being affected by the coronavirus and um, what they're doing to fight back, uh, what projects they're working on, and so on and so forth. And with me today, um, we have Iltifat, Dr. Iltifat Hamzavi, um, who's a dermatologist with the Henry Ford Health System, and he's also one of the founding members of the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. Uh, and they're doing some really great research right now on Muslims involved on the front lines of the coronavirus fight. Um, so we'll get to that, but I wanted to first uh, start with asking you about yourself and how you're doing. How's your family dealing with the virus right now? So I think like all, all families were under a little bit of stress. Our two college children had to come home from college. Um, our daughter is uh, home, but, but as a whole, there's just like so much in our faith, there's so many blessings. We get to see our kids all the time nowadays. It's like a second childhood for them. Um, we actually have them getting so bored sometimes that they want to do chores, which is you know amazing. And um, it's it's hard because I've been in and out of the hospital, and, and my wife's also an internist, so you don't get get to see our parents in person as much just because of the risk of transmission. Um, but we found all these new friends and all these new opportunities and. Yes, um, you know, I think we still go back to that Islamic uh, ayah and Quran with every hardship that comes ease. And there are so many pandemic blessings that we're noticing. We actually met our neighbors and spoke to them from six feet away a few days ago. And that was very nice. We were very close to two of our neighbors, but the other one we didn't know. And, uh, and again, there, there's, there's blessings through all these opportunities. Uh, seeing you guys do your work over there at Halal Metropolis and ISP doing its work. But uh, but blessings with whatever uh, life that we do have. Yeah, thank you. And and you know, you guys are really uh, on the front lines of this battle. And um, I really want to know a little bit more about the work that you're doing at Henry Ford. And um, it, it, you guys have come up with the sterilization uh, methodology for uh, cleaning masks so they can be reused. Um, tell me about how that project came about. So I think maybe three or four weeks ago when the pandemic was starting, my sister-in-law, Aisha Khadri in Chicago, is an anesthesiologist and she had to intubate somebody with inadequate personal protective equipment and, um, and was very concerned. And there's also a lot of mental trauma with all this. So we were talking and, and my wife and I were both uh, very bothered by it. And we were seeing all this happen in the news and we I approached my chairman um, well, actually, I didn't put my chairman first. I started working with our physicists. We have a very highly regarded photomedicine team that looks at the effect of UV light on the skin. And I approached our physicists about deconstructing one of our very expensive testing devices to see if we could get UVC, because UVC is a well-known germicidal agent. If any of you have worked in a research lab, you'll often see that lamp that protects the hood from getting infected. And so I talked to her about repurposing it. So Dr. Coley, a physicist, said that we could potentially do it but do you really want to deconstruct a $65,000 piece of equipment for an experiment? And uh, so I talked to my chairman, Dr. David Ozog, and he said, well, not sure if this is, will work. Um, let me check. And then he said, well, it's such a good idea. They have these UV robots. Um, and I told Dr. Ozog, I said, but the UV robots, we don't know what the dosing is. We don't know if it's going to be used in a mask. There's no testing on that. And, um, and so he's like, well, get me more information. So I started frantically working on the project. At the same time, one of my manufacturing colleagues in Ohio, uh, Bob Golding, sent us an email saying, you know, I'm trying to get this UVC project going. Could you help us? Could you share some information? Could you, um, you know, what, are your, what are your thoughts? And I was like, Bob, we're going to start working on it right now. So that, the, the, we started working on Thursday. Bob emailed on Saturday night. Sunday, I got approval from my chairman, David Ozak, who has been so incredibly supportive. And then our former chairman, the founder of our group, is Henry Lim. He is one of the world's foremost experts on UV light in the skin, and he fully put everything he had into it. He's uh, wow. still practicing, but kind of partially retired. And then we activated all of our fellows, our research fellows, and we had these emergency meetings. And there's hundreds and maybe thousands of hours now that are into this project, but we started meeting every two hours to get the initial concept down, get the dosing down, work with uh, Dablin to devise a dose. So we were simultaneously designing experiments, implementing experiments, Dablin would do those over in Ohio, and then we would zoom back and forth. And then, uh, and then I started going back and forth to Ohio. They started coming back and forth to Detroit. And we did the first set of masks to see how it would work. And then we got the Henry Ford Health System on board. All the quality control, infection control people within hours to days had their top people trying to help us figure out how to get the, the protocol straight. 
and we had volunteers coming for testing. We ran through all the testing, a, a testing called fit testing. And then we eventually got that approved um, to, to use a class system. By that time, the personal, uh, um, there's a mask called the N95, I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, there's different models of it. Those are the masks that really protect a frontline healthcare worker, a nurse, a uh, nurse anesthetist, an anesthesiologist, an ICU um, nurse or physician, or staff, a respiratory therapist, and they're getting covered with the debris mm -hmm. that occurs when people are coughing or intubating. And by that time, the supplies are starting to run low and, and Henry Ford Health System asked us to kind of deploy these units so there's all the politics of a large healthcare system, but they were very open. And Dr. Ozog, our chair, navigated the whole system. He said, let's just get this deployed. So we deployed them in, uh, in uh, um, Henry Ford Macomb. Uh, and then that was the first part. And we developed all these protocols. All the nurses helped with us, us out with it. Probably the greatest um, benefit of this, or the most emotional, meaningful benefit, was when Dr. Ozog and myself would go into these units and the nurses, the docs were all very nervous about the technology. We explained how what we had done so far. We can't absolutely guarantee that the virus is eradicated, but the CDC had done some really good studies four years ago with the H1N1 pandemic and is really good governmental research and we could replicate everything they were doing. And we said, they did this already. We're pretty sure this will work. And, uh, and then they were nervous, but we walked the science and everybody knew that at the end of the day, this was much better than reusing a mask again and again or God forbid, like they're doing in some places in New York, just using a bandana. And so yeah. um, after that, at this point, we sterilized well over a thousand masks across three of the Henry Ford Health Systems. Uh, we are helping Dablin with the emergency FDA approval. And, um, and, uh, and we've been working with the CDC guidelines. And now nationally, they have suggested UVC light as one of three options to re-sterilize masks. Um, and we're also working on virology with the University of Michigan to document that we can actually kill this strain of the virus, but we do know that this can kill multiple similar strains. Um, and so, um, so this is uh, three and a half weeks out, working probably 80 hours a week, still working wow. on these things, and the multiple publications um, yeah. and on this emergency publications. Our Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology is incredible. And we get a peer-reviewed um, journal that usually takes about six months to publish within two weeks. Wow. It's really incredible how fast um, all of this has mobilized and come together. So, you know, kudos to you and kudos to your team for doing it. And, um, you know, one of the things I'm wondering is, uh, obviously, this could have really amazing implications for hospitals all across the country, all around, around the world. And so what are, you know, kind of how does that look in terms of being able to help hospitals outside of Michigan and outside of the country? Um, how are you guys thinking about that? So we really have to get the dosing right because there's lots of UVC lamps out there throughout the world and, uh, and there are devices that existed well before we came around sterilizing it, but does it kill this specific virus mm -hmm. and does it kill associated viruses? Because you don't want to just kill this virus and somebody get the flu or a fungal infection or bacterial infection from their mask. So we've really tried to work on that and I think we've addressed most of those concerns with the various photo medicine modeling around the mask, which is very detailed work that Dr. Coley has helped lead in our group. And so that information will be useful because now that we have an actual photo medicine model, you can take any mask, being an engineer yourself, once you have the model, you can predict what it's gonna do, and then you can measure it. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually several Muslim engineers, Akbar Husseini, helped to design and find the UV paper to truly prove that the mask was getting irradiated with the right dose. So now um, we've been sharing this technology across the world. Um, uh, Davlin, the company that we're partnering with, has sold 13, 15 devices throughout the United States. Um, we've assisted hospitals in Boston, in, uh, in uh, Toronto, in, um, in Cleveland, and, and multiple other cities to help get their units going, uh, New York City. Um, we've also um, assisted uh, places in India, in Pakistan, in uh, Thailand, uh, get wow. these units going. Um, Singapore has also um, used some of this in, in information. And again, the lamps are there. They're not too expensive. They're, they're found in your fish tank. But mm. you have to use them at the right dose, the right distance, the right angle with certain masks. And that knowledge now is going to be institutionalized and humanity can use it. Um, and now the advantage of UVC light is that all you have to do is adjust the dose. And as long as the materials can hold up, 
to be able to kill the virus. Mm. And, uh, and, uh, and, but there's also a concern because there were, uh, were the other centers that did some innovative technology, but they were underdosing the mask. And we had to do a lot of gentle political pushback to say, no, this is the dose, this is the dose. But eventually great scientists across the world looked at the literature, looked at the data, and came to the same conclusions. And we were using one joule of UVC right from the beginning, and we actually went up to 1.5 just to make sure we got the kill rate. A lot of centers were using 60, 330, 500, but they weren't delivering the appropriate dosing to every portion of the mask. Those small details matter. That consistent replication of data matters. And some people don't always value it, but we do know that that frontline person, because I'm not intubating anybody, those people are. And we haven't slept very well for four weeks because mm -hmm. we don't want to be the person who potentially doesn't mitigate this the best we can. The best option is to always have new masks. That's not always a possibility. In resource constrained environments, in the US we were never resource constrained. Even the most difficult urban rural hospital, we could get equipment. This never yeah. happened before. Mm. But if we have to do it again, now we can do it. But that is going to benefit the whole world because in places that might face the pandemic in certain parts of Latin America or South Asia or, or even parts of the U.S., now they have the device. And, uh, and the device is relatively inexpensive. And, uh, and again, we're gonna, we've already shared the information in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology. Um, and we have three or four more papers, and then uh, we've done interviews and, and done lectures. So now the schematics and those things are all available to anybody who wants to do it. So you mentioned an interesting point about uh, the fish tanks. Now, uh, this, this light uh, on a consumer level is available uh, to some extent. Um, you know, uh, so uh, are there any thoughts of creating a prescriptive advice for people to be able to do this at home? Uh, or what are your thoughts on that? I think you can, but these are very high dose of UVC. So I developed a UVC burn in my forehead. Um, oh, wow. Um, and the very first nurse who did this at Henry Ford McComb, she was very methodical and we gave her clear instructions, do not approach within three feet once the device is on, but she was just wanting to make sure the mask was taken care of. She developed a slight burn in the side of her neck. Wow. And so, um, so, so now we've had no further burns. And then we also did some testing to see if normal sunscreens that block UVB and UVA light will work on UVC light because normally UVC comes to the sun is blocked by ozone so you don't get exposed to it and then in a fish tank the glass and water is enough to block it from hitting a human being and then in water filtration areas to sanitize water they use it in those areas but when you're directly putting on the human skin it's a, it's a known irritant and we don't know what the cancer risk is Mm. And so, uh, but there are some forms of UVC, which do not seem to induce cancer in some mouse models. But you don't really know this until, you know, wide range acceptance is there. Um, on Facebook, when some, one of the staff or one of my friends messaged me and, and there's a company that's selling a UV hand sanitizer. Um, that's like walking into a very dangerous place because we know UVB and UVA causes skin cancer. And uh, that's the most mm -hmm. common cancer in the United States. And so now, you know, you know, use a high dose UVC device on the skin. You, know, you have to be careful about that. So yes, it can be used, um, but there are eye effects as well um, and, um, and skin effects. So you really have to protect yourself. This is, this is germicidal. It kills biologic machinery. It disrupts mm -hmm. DNA. Um, you just want to make sure it doesn't go into your, the lower portion of your skin, which we don't think it does. But a lot of the experiments we ran have dismissed some of the earlier knowledge that we had about UVC. UVC goes through mass. That's great because now we know we can sterilize a, a mask and the band all the way through. That also means it probably goes deeper in your skin than what we thought it was. And so you have to kind of just be very careful and, and kind of let the science play out, make the device cheap, but also people have to be aware of what they're dealing. This is not uh, your fish tank or your nail salon UVC lamp. So yeah, so pr people probably shouldn't try this at home. <laughs> <laughs> try this at home. Yeah, in the hospital, you have to dose and and place the mask at the right distance. Um, yeah, and, you know, um, use the right type of mask. Great. I, you know, please keep us posted. You know, with how this is going, and we'll certainly uh, be on the lookout. You know, this is really amazing work. It's very innovative and. Um, you know, inshallah, it's going to save and protect a lot of lives. Um, you know, switching gears a little bit, I wanted to um, 
talk to you a little bit about uh, ISPU. Um, I know that you guys are doing a lot in terms of information and research on the Muslim community um, during the coronavirus uh, with uh, Muslim healthcare workers being on the front lines. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the initiatives and research projects that you guys are working on? Sure, so um, I'm the former chair of the board. I'm still on the board, but ISPU is run by a wonderful group of people. Myron Nagaz is the executive director, Dali Mogahed, um, and our board members have done an incredible um, amount of work and also our, our research staff. So the projects that they've been working on, and again, I've been hunkered down in either a ER, ICU, or working in a photomedicine closed research lab. And then also seeing patients in my private practice, trying to keep that yeah. going. So, um, so, but I've, I've been getting updates from them. So a couple of things they're doing. One is they have gone out of their way to document what you're doing right now to find people across the country, but do an ISP style, deep quantitative work and very, very deep qualitative work and finding out how the infrastructure was set up, how the ecosystem was set up. And so they have those stories, just like the map study that you were part of, that you were featured in. Um, um, uh, Muslims, Americans, uh, Muslims for American Progress, they're continuing on with that work. And they're doing it in every cent um, city that they can identify in the United States. Because one of the things that people hopefully will appreciate is that, for example, in Michigan, 15% of all physicians are Muslim. Muslims have led this effort. And, uh, and so I just, we just wrote a letter, a fundraising appeal. And one of the things that I mentioned in my report is that the, one of the national directors for the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, which helped us think through a lot of the stuff, happened to be Muslim. Um, they were virologists who happened to be Muslim. And then those Muslims had so many non-Muslim friends who connected us together. And that sense of just take care of humanity is part of many religions, many cultures, but among the Muslim ethos, it's a very powerful sense. And part of the reason we move so fast is because people just wanted to get this thing right. Well, people are doing that across the front lines. We have dermatologists who are volunteering to work in the ICU. We have anesthesiologists who have intubated people faster than they've ever had to intubate, have developed new machines and devices to protect the frontline workers, while also having neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons who have, um, 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 and, and, and others, and pulmonologists who have passed away or battling for their lives right now because they've developed coronavirus themselves. Mm. Those are the same stories the rest of the country is going through, but there's a Muslim perspective here. Um, there's also um, incredible stories about um, moms and fathers who have developed online curriculum that they've shared across the country to keep kids learning. Um, we have learned about uh, different groups that have created um, online platforms to allow for youth to deal with trauma and psychological impacts of this. Uh, there are groups that are working on um, inmates to make sure that uh, they do not get infected and they're protected. And so all those stories are being collected. On top of that, um, as you probably know, masjids are also getting hit very hard. If you are an imam or a custodian or a, um, a, a youth rep and a masjid right now, it is a difficult time because they also have very limited um, funding streams. We have never canceled Jummah. People have bombed us, the plague has hit us and all these other things and we had to cancel physical Jummahs. And so the community has been able to move to a Zoom type platform, a FaceTime platform, online platform, but it puts masjids at very difficult positions, especially on masjids that provide food security or housing security or counseling security. And so ISP is documenting how communities are dealing with that, but they also have the original reimagining Muslim spaces tools. And so ISP's two decades of work is so helpful because now you have a reservoir of well thought out research to help your masjid through structural issues. It's also taking the exact same platform and documenting Muslim contributions to the COVID-19 pandemic. And all that will be helpful because when you have infrastructure and it's thoughtfully developed, you can deploy it in an emergency and ISP is doing that. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I think one of our upcoming interviews is with Mira and, and so we'll be able to dive much deeper into uh, some of this research. Um, so uh, Iltifad, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your time and thank you for all the work that you're doing uh, and, uh, and helping support the fight against coronavirus and saving lives. And, you know, please keep it up. We'll definitely be watching what you're doing. Um, you know, stay safe and um, have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank well, you. Thanks for what you're doing in Loud Metropolis. I'm a big fan, as you know. <laughs> thank you. All right. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.